I'm at the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. She is currently developing the Nicholas Institute and Duke's expanding initiative on ecosystem services. She is coordinating Duke's Ecosystem Services Working Group, the development of a national ecosystem services partnership, and the Institute's program on greenhouse gas offsets. Um, welcome to um, Lydia Olander, who is going to start with a talk on understanding ecosystem services. Thank you. So thank you very much for having me here today. So I was asked to talk broadly about the concept of ecosystem services and, um, and its use. I think it's a very useful framework for thinking about our environment and what it provides to people. Um, the questions I think we are grappling with now is, um, is operationalizing this concept and using it um, for resource management and decision making more broadly um, and trying to incorporate it more into standard practices. It's um, a concept that is moving beyond the realm of scientists and economists and others studying it um, to being incorporated into the activities and actions of conservation organizations of governments and corporations. So it's definitely moving into the oper oper op operational phase. So ecosystem services is, is not an entirely new concept. Um, there's been a lot of debate about the benefits nature provides to people. This is just one of many different examples. Um, so you know, we're looking at Earth's resources for the good of men. Um, but what's, I think, new is that we are um, looking at a broader range of services. Before, we tended to look at timber production, um, crop production, fish production, um, all things that we still look at, but we're looking beyond those, and we're starting to categorize, quantify, and value um, these services um, beyond these typical services. One of the, I mean, in, in, from my perception watching this and from some others that I've talked to, um, one of the key events that changed some thinking in the scientific community um, in the early 1990s was the Biosphere 2 experiments where they tried to recreate the biosphere and have a self-sustaining environment. And um, it didn't work so well. Um, the first experiment, they had oxygen levels plummeted, um, CO2 levels um, skyrocketed, nitrous oxide rose to levels that impaired brain function, water purification failed, 19 of 25 vertebrate species died, pollinators went extinct, um, ants and cockroaches exploded, although they took over some of the pollinating role. Um, so, so basically, it was difficult, and, and this kind of concept of there's a whole bunch of different things nature's providing to us um, that are the underpinning and supporting um, the well-being of people. And so when we start to pull all these pieces together, we're not looking just at providing food and fiber, but we're looking at regulating our atmospheric composition, we're looking at filtering air and water, and these, all these things become these ecosystem services that lead to human health and well-being. And this is really the fundamental structure that went into the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which I'll be talking about as a primary kind of framing um, piece for ecosystem services. And this was a synthesis with over 1,000 scientists, a large number, number of organizations, and has really been a foundation moving forward for thinking on ecosystem services. So they categorize services in a specific way, and a number of people have moved beyond this, but I still think it's a useful starting point. There's the traditional services we used to think of, the provisioning services, the crops, the livestock, the fisheries, also the timber and cotton and fuel, fuel wood, the fiber, but also genetic resources, freshwater provision, um, biochemicals we get from the environment. So these are the ones that tend to have market values that we tend to think of regularly. Then there's a whole bunch of other things that are important that are regulating services. Um, climate regulation, air quality, erosion regulation, water purification, disease and pest regulation, pollination, 
um, natural hazard. Um, so flood protection is an example I'm going to talk about today a little bit. So a bunch of things that are really important for people in the regulatory, regulating services. And then uh, more kind of abstract but also very important category was the cultural services. Spiritual and religious values, knowledge systems, educational values, aesthetic values, um, recreation, ecotourism, solitude, um, a whole bunch of other characteristics that are a little harder to pin down but also very important for human well-being. Um, one example that came up recently when I was um, working with the Forest Service in Puerto Rico is they think, they think darkness. Darkness is a very important part of the ecosystem for them. Um, it's important for ecotourism and recreation. There's bioluminescent bays that are a real big part of ecotourism there. Of course, stargazing would be nice if you could see them. But there's also important impacts on food webs. Um, they're finding pollinators impacted. Their uh, insects are getting pulled into lights, and bats and birds are getting hit by cars. And so they're having big impacts on their food webs and services may be impacted there. And they also noted that there are human health impacts of having too much light pollution. So darkness fits in here somehow, too. So it's kind of thinking beyond the usual suspects, as ecosystem services really forces us to do that. So this framework also includes support, supporting services, which underlie all of these other services. And these are things like photosynthesis, soil formation, and nutrient cycling. And um, so when we think of this, one of the other kind of ideas and um, thinking behind this is that biodiversity is underpinning all of this. And um, often I've, you've heard the, the metaphor around this about, you know, we have an airplane and it's got rivets and as it loses species it's losing rivets and it loses enough of those and we lose enough services that the plane's not working as well and the earth isn't working as well and then eventually the plane will go down. And so this biodiversity underpinning of all these services is part of the thinking that went into the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment as well. So when I think about how people are trying to use this framework, there's two different um, ways that people are using it that I think um, that I think about a lot. The first one is tracking the state of the environment as it relates to people. And so looking at trends in ecosystem services. And the second is how to use this as a tool to improve our management of natural resources. So looking at the first one, so we can explicit explicitly include ecosystem services in our thinking. We have an increase in floods, which is increasing our impact on coastal populations, direct mortality impacts on health, disease vectors, and many others. But we need to understand the causes of this increased flooding so we can understand the drivers of this change and the trends in these drivers. So one of the examples that they looked at in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment was they were seeing this trend of increasing flood impacts across the globe. And there's two reasons they highlighted for this. One is that there's more people living in these at-risk regions. But the other is that there's a significant loss of coastal habitat, which provides flood protection. So now you can incorporate the loss of the habitat in the ecosystem service, the reducing of flood protection caused by this loss of coastal habitat. So we're starting to create these linkages between loss of an ecosystem, which gives a loss of a service. But in addition to looking at this one service, we can start thinking about the other services that are lost along with the loss of coastal habitat. So we also have an uh, impact on shellfish and fish nurseries. So we have less fish, maybe, less fish-related jobs, higher cost of fish, less fish in the diet. You can also think about a reduction in carbon storage in these systems, which contributes to climate change impacts. There's also reduction in nitrogen transformation and storage in these systems. So perhaps an increased impact of nitrogen loading and a risk of eutrophication in dead zones in regions. But then on the other side, maybe we get better wave energy if we have, don't have seagrasses in the way. So I mean, there's just pluses and minuses to think about in these different systems as well. So the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment did a very large scale trends assessment and as was mentioned already in the introduction, they found the bottom line, 60% of ecosystem services are degraded. This was 15 out of the 24 services they evaluated. Um, and so really significant impacts on these services moving forward. The other thing they really did um, well, I think, in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment is they really tried to build the linkages between the services and a, and a framework for how that fits with human well-being. 
So I'm not sure if they've ex they, that explored it fully, but they definitely set up a framework for thinking about it. And over a lot of aspects of health are incorporated into this framework. You can see in the um, different um, listings up on the right-hand side, I guess I have a over here, you can see that there's nutrition involved, there's actually different aspects of health embedded specifically, feeling well, access to clean air and water and strength, but there's also social aspects of health. So health is kind of embedded throughout the whole um, framework that they've developed. Moving on to the second um, use of ecosystem services that I think is important. Um, so we can, um, we want to understand how changes in management result in changes in the production of ecosystem services. So we want to understand changes in the magnitude of flow, the timing of flow, the location of flow of these services, and how does the flow go from different people that are, or places that are providing these services to where these services are being used. So we want to understand the dynamics of all of these, and production functions is one of the terms used in the scientific community to understand this relationship. So for my example, if we had a percent of coastal habitat loss, what percent decrease in flood protection is results from that, and therefore what percent of impact do we have, whether that's mortality or something else. So what does that relationship look like, and is it different for different types of coastal habitat or where that coastal habitat is? So trying to understand those relationships in more detail. But beyond just understanding an individual service and its relationship, we want to understand the trade-offs and synergies across services. And so we start looking at that list of services I thought of earlier. We're not only impacting um, the coastal populations, we're impacting fisheries with this loss of coastal habitat. So maybe, maybe a small change in coastal habitat has a large impact on fisheries, but only a small impact on flood production. So I'm trying to understand those relationships across services. And then on top of that, if we want to make decisions, we have to evaluate trade-offs. And we need to understand the value of these various different services we're looking at. And this is where stakeholder values and economic values come into the assessments and when we're getting into decision making. So one example from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment that I thought was a really compelling example when I first saw this was one on mangroves. Um, they talk about the long list of services we get from natural mangroves in terms of fishery, habitat, um, timber, carbon sequestration, detoxifying pollutants, protection from storms. But there's also a lot of other services you could get from mangroves, um, the shrimp farming, crop production, housing developments. And they have a picture here from Honduras looking at the development of a mangrove system over time. And there was an analysis that they, um, they showed that said if you look at the typical kind of market value you might get from these systems as a mangrove and as a shrimp farm, you might choose to put shrimp farms there. But as they started to look at the other types of services and disservices from these systems, you might make a different decision. And so starting to incorporate these other values and services changes the decisions that might be made. So I'm going to talk a little bit about other ways of valuing. So that's, that was an economic valuation approach. This is an example of a spreadsheet tool that really is more of a qualitative approach some folks are using to look at ecosystem services. So this is an example spreadsheet tool that some folks from the Forest Service are playing with um, to look at a, for a project. And they're looking at different management options um, over here on the left-hand side. And they're looking at the impact of those on a variety of services they've identified as important for this, this project in this region. And what they're saying is for these different management options, they have different impacts on the services. A positive impact, a negative impact, or no impact. And they're using this to help them figure out where there may be issues with the different management strategies they're considering, which ones might be better than others, um, just as a first step in trying to understand what services matter to them and to their process. So when I think and talk about tools um, and quantification of ecosystem services, I find this is a useful framework. This is um, from a paper by de Groot et al. in, in 2010. Um, 
And I think about ecosystem services, we, we tend to talk about the underlying ecosystem and the functions that ecosystem provides, but then we're moving into talking about the services to people that are provided, and then from there the benefits that we obtain from those services, and then we try to put value on top of that. So this is kind of the chain of logic we're walking through. It's also the chain that we see incorporated into a lot of the tools that are being developed for quantifying these services. The other thing I'll note is that you can quantify it multiple steps along this chain. There are a lot of tools that really try to quantify the change in the provision of the services itself, looking at just trade-offs and production of different services. And then there are those that try to move a little bit more into the benefits and quantifying those, all the way to those that actually put economic values on or rank based on stakeholder values. And so there's this sweet, um, I think, the increase in complexity and difficulty and uncertainty as you move to the right, but I also think they, in some ways, may increase in effectiveness and value in communicating to decision makers. And so when I look in the literature and I look at this, there's a lot of research, a lot of examples out there. There's not really standard practice at this point. It's still an evolving um, kind of tool development space and, and methods space. One of the, the, the complexities in the valuation side, and this is from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, is it's pretty easy to get at the market values that we typically looked at, the market services, um, food, fiber, but it gets much, much more difficult as we move up the spectrum towards the regulating services and the cultural services to actually place values on these and get all the way to the right end of my tool spectrum. And so it's very difficult to capture that benefit in our, in our models um, and, and look at those trade-offs in a, in a comparable way across those services. So this is a very quick view and an incomplete view, but I'm just trying to give a sense of a whole suite of tools that are being developed right now um, and being tested in different ways by different users that are out there for ecosystem services. Um, so there's this, this ranges from qualitative tools, so the Ecosystem Services Review by World Resources Institute is a list of pointed questions that walk you through to try to help you identify your services and which ones matter in your, your, in your, in your um, specific project or um, decision-making process. And then there's a spreadsheet tool. I showed you an example of it, and there's other examples out there um, that qualitatively walk you through figuring out which services matter to you and what's happening with them. And then there's map-based tools. So EPA has been developing a sustainability atlas, um, and they have an urban version of that that's um, incorporating health aspects in. Um, and this is a map-based tool that incorporates existing data and overlays it to try to, quant to quantify and, and spatially locate services. INVEST is a tool that's been developed by the Natural Capital Project um, with uh, Stanford and uh, um, major conservation organizations um, that's in large part based, a bunch of ecologists were in initially built the tool, so it really focuses a lot on moving from the ecosystems into services, but it also has built on some approaches to add value um, to, to those to different examples, and they've been using it all over the world, testing it and exploring it. Um, and there's an effort I'm involved with to try to develop a toolbox for federal agencies for natural resource management um, that could use U.S. data that's available. And then there's some tools on, va on the value side. So um, SOLVES is a tool that some folks at USGS have been developing that is trying to map and determine stakeholder values and actually figure out bio um, where they are in the landscape and how they map to different ecological um, characteristics. And then there's a bunch of values databases trying to come up with economic values. Um, Consval map, which was one um, that mapped different um, studies across the, the world and had where and had economic values. Um, and then that's been evolved into the, the Marine Ecosystem Services Partnership, which is mapping marine studies. And then serves is a new database that Earth Economics is developing that's trying to collect all the economic studies that are out there. And then ARIES and MIMES are also map-based tools, and they try to, they, they're really focused on getting all the way to valuation and economic value. And then, uh, this is kind of hard to see, but there's also, like, 
the ecosystem-based tools network, which has over a thousand tools in it that have been developed by academics all over the world. Um, some of those are more ecosystem services based than others, but there's a large suite of tools out there that do a whole bunch of different things. Um, and I, I think this is a, there's a, the Business for Social Responsibility group has been looking and doing some side-by-side -side comparisons of some of these tools. And they do a nice job of kind of showing the, the variety of, of, of where these tools fit in the spectrum. And you can see that there's the suite that are computer models with explicit maps up here. And then these are more qualitative tools down here. Here we've got a, those that don't really emphasize valuation, some that do, and then a different between more kind of fine scale analysis and, and coarse grain analysis. So the tools range across a large spectrum. One other thing that I thought might be useful and we're thinking about how these ecosystem services based tools may be useful for thinking about public health outcomes is there's some obvious connections between air and water quality and risk mitigation that are already built into some of these tools and models um, that you may be able to link directly to health outcomes. But there's also some more subtle examples. This is um, a, an example from this uh, tool for federal agencies that's being developed. And this is um, for biodiversity connectivity for species. But you could also flip this around and think of it as a pathway for disease vectors. That isn't why it's been built, but it could be used to look at that. And one of our researchers said, hey, we could look at Lyme disease transfer using these kinds of maps. So I think there's a lot of pieces of these tools that could be used to think about health outcomes as well as ecological outcomes. So it'd be interesting to look at them that way. So just to kind of bring this all together, I think the ecosystem services framework is a very useful framework for kind of thinking more broadly about how the environment impacts people and to incorporate this into our decision making so we're looking beyond the typical market services that we get. Um, I think it leads to better decisions. I think there's, we're in the opera, opera I can't have trouble with that word, opera, trying to operationalize ecosystem services. Um, has, I think it's a complex topic, and the tools, it, we're, we're learning a lot, but we're still, I think, not there. Um, and figuring out how to do quantitative analysis um, in a more standardized way is a complex and continuing challenge um, that I think the community's facing right now. So that's all I have. We're actually going to have time for questions and discussions after the next um, presentation. Thank you so much for a wonderful overview. And I know that our next speaker is, um, is available via video link. And as they're getting him up, um, I'm going to go ahead and give an introduction. We're going to hear from Tracy Collier about integration of environmental health and marine ecosystem services in Puget Sound and beyond. Um, a, um, um, to go from the, um, the overview to a specific um, um, region of the country. Um, he is the science director for the Puget Sound Partnership and a visiting scientist at the Center for Urban Waters in Tacoma. He is also serving as a science advisor for NOAA's o 